If you've been riding one by drivetrains for the last two or three years, there is a very good chance that you already stumbled upon this problem because it's so endemic among them. And I'm talking of course about the backpedaling issue. It is so annoying that for the top group of the 1x12 drivetrains, SRAM had to design its own special way of dealing with this. How does it work or how does it happen? Well, you've got a set of gears that when you backpedal, for whatever reason, your chain is going to drop. It doesn't happen on this gear, even though it is a very low gear. However, it does happen on this one. As you can see, the chain had chosen freedom. What's the core issue that causes this to happen? And of course, the answer is chain line. 11 speed is essentially 10 speed with the 11th cog simply added to it. Cogs are slightly closer together on 11 speed, however, they are so mm, not really th that much closer that you can use 10 speed cassettes on 11 speed drivetrains and it usually works perfectly. So, let's see how does a chain line look on this uh, lowest gear on the 11 speed drivetrain. Okay, I switched to a phone, so expect massive quality loss and shaky footage. This is my chain ring, this is my biggest cog. As you can see, there is a rather high planar uh, separation between them. It's about 25 millimeters, and it's more than this cog can handle when it comes to a chain approaching it at uh, an angular distance or at an angle. Of course, I have a narrow white chain ring on the front, so there is no problem here. The chain ring is going to handle this perfectly. Uh, on the 2x system, it would drop from here. However, it can't because the 1x with the narrow white. So the next place of failure is here. Alright, if you are a cassette manufacturer, you might be interested, wink wink, what to do and why does it happen? Well. If you look closely, you will see that it only happens here. And this is a magical place because there is a shift gate here. And in order to explain it further, I'll need to, let's just say, change the venue. All right, the venue has been changed. This is a spider from a dead 11, uh, 1128 Shimano SLX uh, 9 speed cassette. I'm going to be using it as a prop. Now this part here, this cutout, is called a shift gate and it's a part of a Shimano Hyperglide system. An index shifter is another part of that system. Uh, this part here is responsible for that uh, fluid and almost effortless feeling when you change gears, when you uh, change a gear and you just feel that uh, the mm, tension on the chain or how hard it is on the pedals has changed slightly. You don't have that jerky feeling that you, which could happen on older designs. It works like this. If I am a derailleur here, here I am, this is my uh, guide pulley, and I uh, am shifted to the uh, bigger gear, uh, the chain is not forced on it, but it is gently put by interweaving with the teeth on the other cog and uh, through the easements on the, of the shift gate. It is designed in a way that regardless whether the chain comes narrow first, which is here, or a wide first, it's always going to be gently put on the other cog. Shimano has been using this system since, I believe, 1989 or thereabouts. And if you are interested, uh, just about any other manufacturer is using uh, this kind of system. There are minor details which make one different from the other, but for the end user, they are essentially identical. All right, so what's the problem with this ingenious system when it comes to the backpedaling? Well, the problem is that shift gate, the entire structure of teeth which are chamfered in specific directions on each side and uh, I don't know whether you'll be able to, to see it but they are bent on the one or the other side depending on which uh, tooth of the shift gate, shift gate it is. This entire structure is bidirectional 
and the only thing that's stopping it from uh, shifting uh, from the bad direction is the fact that in normal use you don't see the chain being bent in an angle that makes the shift gate engage. Uh, that, however, happens when you backpedal on that 11-speed cassette because the chain line causes the chain to disengage from the cog, like this. And because the chain is usually uh, fairly uh, stiff uh, from side to side, it uh, what usually happens is that it's dropping two or three or four cogs, jams on the entire structure of the cassette, and once you start pedaling forward, it is forcefully pulled away from it, often causing quite a lot of damage. I hope this close-up is visible, and I'm going to show you where this cascade failure begins. If you take a look at the shift gate from various angles, you will notice that teeth on it are chamfered in a very specific way. This is to allow the chain to enter the shift gate and uh, fit on the cock it is actually getting uh, shifted to, like this. If you take a look at this particular tooth, you will notice that it is chamfered in a very specific way to allow the chain to enter from uh, this angle. Here you see this angle. If a chain line is very awkward, uh, this chamfering will allow the chain to leave the sprocket, okay, leave the sprocket and fall down the cog stack. Okay then, so let's discuss solutions. Number one is obviously doing what SRAM does in its Eagle series of drive trains, which is making the two biggest cogs narrow wide. Two biggest cogs because chain line is most severe there, so the backpedaling problem is going to manifest itself just there. This solution obviously works because Eagle drive trains don't suffer from uh, backpedaling. However, it introduced another problem. Since you cannot really guarantee that the chain is going to approach the narrow white profile from in a way that always meshes with the narrow white profile. Uh, each Eagle cassette uh, is shaped in a way that uh, ensures that the chain is going to jump to its proper so to its proper position on the chain ring when you shift and it's not synchronized. This is called resensing, and it is a reason for that jerky feeling you get in the Eagle drivetrains every once in a while. And obviously, it solved one problem. However, it introduced another solution number two: do nothing. We are very, uh, just say, capable of adjusting to a situation that isn't really optimal or comfortable, so after a while of riding in a drivetrain that back but drops the chain when backpedaling, you'll simply get used to it and doesn't bother you. This isn't obviously a solution, but, well, it's an approach to the problem, isn't it? Solution number three is obviously fixing the chain line on the uh, mountain bike drivetrains, because it has been off for so long that we just got used to it. This is not really a solution, however, it would obviously solve the problem. It isn't a solution because while the new bicycles would use a new uh, rear dropout spacing and a different chain line and a different cranks, maybe a different rear hubs, old bicycles would still suffer from this problem. Besides, we all love new standards, don't we? And finally, solution number four, which is to make drivetrains resistant to awkward chain angles or more resistant to awkward chain angles. We've been recently treated to a 13-speed uh, drivetrain from Rotor, so I think this is the only solution we have at this point. I have already noted that part of this approach is to make the shift gate one directional, however, there's more than that to it. And I need to draw something in order to show you what I mean. Alright, so here are the figures. Number one is what needs to be done, uh, well, the first step what needs to be done in order to make this problem slightly less annoying. And that is to offset the peaks of the teeth on the uh, largest cog, or two largest cogs, to the outside of the bike. Here it's approximately 0.35 of a millimeter, and that emulates uh, shifting the chain line slightly, well, 0.35 of a millimeter, to the outside of the bike, making the chain line slightly better. Obviously, this doesn't move the cog, because if we move the cog, we would destroy the indexing. However, this should make meshing the chain being back pedal slightly easier. Figure number two. What needs to be done to the tooth the problem originates from? Essentially, 
This tooth, being a part of a shift gate, is responsible for uh, allowing the chain in uh, the chain ring uh, from the lower cog. In order to fix the problem of the pedaling, I think it should suffice to shift the peak of this uh, tooth slightly to the inside of the bike. Here, for example, is 0.35 mm, but that's not a, a figure that I uh, managed to get through experimentation, it's just for the purpose of presentation. Figure number 3 shows us what needs to be done to the tooth that's next to the originator. Uh, this one is also a part of a shift gate, however, uh, here is uh, responsible for catching the chain while being backpedaled in order to make sure that it's not going to drop to the lower cogs. What needs to be done here is to move the peak of this tooth even more to the outside than the peaks of the other teeth. You can see here that the uh, shift gate pocket is inside of the tooth and the peak is almost entirely at the edge of the chain ring. Figure number 4. On 11-speed drivetrain it is possible to use cogs that are almost 2 mm thick in spite of uh, the nominal thickness of the uh, cog on such a drivetrain is 1.6 mm. When you're using uh, thicker teeth your chain has less wiggle room and since this problem is caused by chain having too much wiggle room making your teeth thicker, at least on the largest cogs should help the problem uh, of backpedaling. Moreover, if uh, you're using thicker, uh, thicker teeth, you can make your chain or you can make your cogs out of aluminum and thicker teeth should help with uh, rather unfavorable characteristics when it comes to wear. Essentially, this almost emulates a narrow white profile, however, without the added cost of making the resincing a problem, because, well, there's no resincing here. All right then. That was quite a bit of talk, but very little game. So I want to show you something. This is my own little CNC lathe, and I intend to use it to prove my point. I've been recently experimenting with a one by drivetrain on the road, and I am really not satisfied with cog sequences that are available on the mountain cassettes. Even if the range is fine, I usually am missing gears, so I think I'm going. what I'm going to make is to make a custom cassette that's going to use an aluminum cog that I'm going to make, which is going to be using all the principles I have outlined before, and uh, the rest of the cog stack is going to be something standard from Shimano. So watch this space. Anyway, thank you for your undivided attention, and see you on the next one.